skip a moment. Right. So I would be dealing this in the following four headings: the background on of tall stature, growth patterns in children with tall stature, syndrome of tall stature in specific, evaluation and management to some extent. So background. Coming to the phases of human growth, it's very important to understand that thirty percent of the adult height is achieved within the span of nine months of intrauterine life. So intrauterine factors play a major role in this phase. Followed by the next rapid growth phase is in the infantile phase, wherein within the first one year, the infant gains about fifteen percent of adult height. And childhood, the the period from around one year to one to two years onwards, till the prepubertal phase. Of about six to eight years, the child grows about forty percent, and then the pubertal growth spurt contributes to the next fifteen percent. You see here the various factors which can impact the growth during these phases, and these can also lead to diseases, both short stature and tall stature. So, what is tall stature? Tall stature is defined as a height which is more than two standard deviations above the mean height. For a given age and sex, for the population, we see about two point three percent of our population being the tall stature. But how many do we see in our clinics and hospitals? Not much. Why? Because there's a lot of social acceptability. People always want to, almost always, want to gain height, and then they don't want to be short. And it is most of the times a family trait. Whenever a person suddenly is very tall, taller than the parents, they say that the grandparents, somebody, some uncle is very tall. so the familial trait is very important in making somebody tall and this being very acceptable the referral rate is very less and happens only when the height is beyond 2.5 to 3 standard deviation score so referral is more likely only then and problem usually is identified a little later only so why do we think there is a problem here why should we look at tall stature as a problem we need to understand two things most of the tall stature people are very healthy and they're non syndromic but it is important and essential to identify the pathological causes though the numbers may be small the impact of the other problems systemic conditions which accompany the tall stature can jeopardize the life and increase the morbidity and mortality so what do we look at it so we take a few handles and we look at certain features while evaluating tall stature first one is the tempo of the growth the second is height in relation to target height and third is pubertal and skeletal maturation how is how is the puberty what is the bone age that's very important and the last but the most important thing is identifying the syndromic features so these are the handles so taking this background with us let us understand the four basic patterns of growth in patients with tall stature in the first graph you can see that very clearly the child is has been tall since birth always on the higher side see that is familial tall stature we'll come back to what these patterns mean to us in the second pattern you see that the child has been more or less okay for almost uh, mid childhood and then suddenly there's an increase in growth and which is continuing without stopping and the final adult height is very high this is pattern b in in pattern b you see two lines here there is an increased growth and the growth is always on the higher side but after a certain time the growth slows down and the ultimate height is normal in graph c that we are talking about and then the dotted line in graph c you see uh, when you find a child around 7 to 8 years of the age the child is taller than the peers and then gradually the height slow, height velocity slows down and the ultimate height is short stature we all know what it is we'll come back to that so this is pattern c that we see and this is the usual fourth pattern pattern d that we're talking about wherein there is a continued growth in the mid uh, centile and then suddenly it starts increasing after about 12 to 13 years of the age and it it continues going going on in with an upward slope so let us see which conditions we we are here first one is familial tall stature very common so the child has always been tall so large for gestational age no dysmorphisms no intellectual disabilities the adult stature is also tall everyone is tall the child is also tall so the growth pattern is the pattern a that you can see here and then the next one is cag 
So in this, there is no LGA. There is no dysmorphism, no intellectual disability. And the ultimate adult stature is normal. What is happening here? There is a sudden growth spurt that is, growing, that is happening a little faster than the peers. And then again, it is normalizing. So that is the reason there is a growth pattern C here. Can we go back here? We see growth pattern C, the main line, the, the bold line, not the dotted line here. That's what we see here in CAG. And then we have obesity. Obesity, we all know that there's no LGA, there's no dysmorphism. There is a huge role of environment which is there. And intellectual disability is not there. Adult stature is usually normal because you cannot beat your genetic potential. So growth pattern is again C. So there is rapid growth velocity that happens at a certain pace because of the excess nutrients that are available. So next is precocious puberty. Remember the graph C, we go back here and then we see that the in comparison to the peers at around seven to eight years of the age, the height is pretty fast. And then ultimate height is lesser because the epiphyseal fusion is happening here. Right. And the last uh, and, and another one is growth hormone excess. Growth hormone excess, there is no LG, LGA, there is no dysmorphism, may be present, mild in, in earlier phases. And then intellectual disability is not there and the adult stature is tall. Definitely growth hormone during the growth phase is high. So growth pattern may be a combined pattern of B plus D. If you can see here, this is the growth pattern B plus D. So it, it, it depends on when it starts. The growth hormone exists. When it starts, it either goes in B pattern or in D pattern. So coming to the last one, we see that in hypogonadism, what is happening? There is no LGA. There is no dysmorphism also. Maybe present sometimes, uh, which, are, which is very subtle. Uh, and then intellectual disability can be variable. If you're talking about uh, uh, clinical syndrome, yes, there's, there's certain intellectual disability out there. And then adult stature is definitely tall because the epiphysis is not fused. There is no um, the sex steroids out there to fuse the epiphysis. So a growth pattern continues to go on. There is no fusion. There is no slowing or faltering of the growth, which should normally happen. But then that continues to the child continues to grow and the ultimate height is tall stature. So, the tall stature related to chromosomal aneuploidies. We all know that the clinical features of hypogonadism are usually present, especially in Klinefelter syndrome. They manifest as tall stature since the childhood. The child is usually always taller than the peers. And we see that. And, and then in the, in the situation where there's a, so a shock gene involved, then there also there can be tall stature. There are two functional copies in each cell in either sex. And then Klinefelter syndrome, what exactly happens? There's an extra copy of shocks. Gene. So there is extra growth and then there is also hypogonadism that we see. Triple X syndrome and redundant Y syndromes also, they, there is normal gonadal function and tall stature in these conditions. But the growth is non-linear. In fact, the more number of X's increase in females, there is short stature. More number of Y's increase, there is a short stature that we can see. And then now moving on to the third segment of our topic, the syndromic tall stature. The syndromic tall stature, we have to look for dysmorphic features. It's very essential because each syndrome, we deal with about eight to 10 syndromes here. And then each syndrome comes with a set of clues, the handles that we need to take and then move forward. So first thing, how we divide the child is tall. Yes, we've decided. Is it proportionate tall stature or disproportionate tall stature? Proportionate tall stature. We understand. We ask the history, birth history, the child was Bigger from the birth in almost all the tall, proportionate tall stature syndromes except fragile X syndrome. So that birth history of there, it becomes important. How was the baby at birth? And then we move to the main features. So Soto syndrome, the first one. Dolicocephaly is the most important one and other prominent forehead. Can you see this picture here? You can see dolicocephaly and then prominent forehead. And uh, the moment you see this, this kind of face, you identify that this is syndromic and you categorize the patient and you deal with it. They, re they have a broad range of learning disabilities. And putting such a child in a normal school would be very, very unfair to the child and the learning disabilities that the child has. So that is very important here to understand. Next we have in line is Weaver syndrome. What is important here and hallmark here, this hypotonia, loose skin and deep set nails with camptodactyly. That should give us a clue about Weaver syndrome. Next we have fragile X syndrome. The child is, is, is normal when the child was born, but you see that typical scrawny, thin, long face, but with protruding ears. A thin face with protruding ears is what 
defines fragilex syndrome with the face and then you see macroarchidism in boys so you see this here you can typically see that prominent ears in fragilex syndrome and then we have the last syndrome in proportionate tall stature that is simpson gulab uh, gulabi behnal syndrome the child was large when the child was born and their coarse facial features the cutaneous syndactyly various bony abnormalities talpus equinovirus and then pespectus excavatum is there and then there are supernumerary nipples this should give you an idea that you are dealing with sgb syndrome so this is these are the four important things when we see proportionate tall stature so then the next segment is a disproportionate tall stature we have around 6 to 7 syndromes here the first one is marfan syndrome we'll deal with it slightly a little later all the features so we have hyperextensible joints long limbs narrow hands the most important thing why we need to know know about it because untreated it can lead to catastrophic cardiac abnormalities and diagnostic feature also has ophthalmologic abnormalities vision abnormalities doing the slit lamp examination seeing the lens is very important because subluxation and the direction of subluxation gives us an idea and differentiates marfan's from other syndromes the next screen line we have homocystinuria almost the patient looks like marfan's only but then in the lens when we look at it the subluxation of the lens is infranasally in homocystinuria in marfan's it is superiorly so that is what differentiates and homocystinuria why is it important because there's a high risk of thromboembolic phenomenon that occurs in homocystinuria and cardiovascular events and cerebrovascular events occur as early as second and third decade so we need to understand and identify homocystinuria the third is klinefelter syndrome disproportionate short stature learning disabilities difficulty in uh, in, in calculation skills and english language skills which is present other than that there will be only very subtle features in klinefelter syndrome that we need to understand and next one is beckwith wiedemanns and and hypogonadism in klinefelter syndrome not to mention that right so next is beckwith wiedemanns syndrome this beckwith wiedemann syndrome and proteus syndrome are the only two syndromes which when the baby is large when the baby was born and the baby now has the child now has a disproportionate short stature so beckwith wiedemann syndrome you have macrosomia hemihypertrophy macroglossia just as macroglossia abdominal wall defects and neonatal hypoglycemias big babies with neonatal hypoglycemias the with the increased risk of neoplasms all this should point in favor of beckwith wiedemann syndrome we'll deal with it in a couple of pictures also about marfan syndrome beckwith in in a short while and then we have triple x syndrome most important one is clinodactyly and epicanthal folds nothing else will be present intelligence will be normal everything will be okay the patient will just be tall and will have this features next is proteus proteus syndrome is very subtle and you will identify it with macrocephaly and epidermal nevi and vascular malformations that is a typical feature of proteus syndrome so uh, coming back to important syndromes marfan syndrome you all know that it's uh, autosomal autosomal dominant inheritance and a mutation is in fibrillin 1 gene and there are ocular mal mal malformations there is a skeletal abnormality and definitely a cardiac defect you all know that we use revised gens criteria for diagnosis i'm not going into detail of this the next is homocystinuria you can see that it's an it, it has autosomal uh, recessive inheritance it is very very rare but then it has a lot of, of uh, features common with marfan's similar to body habitus the spider like nay the fingers which are there right but these people are prone to thromboembolic phenomena so it's very important to understand a uh, homocystinuria even if it is rare it's important to be identified and prevent a catastrophic event and then as we have said there is a subluxation of the lens ectopia lentis especially intranasal migration of the lens would be present and a diagnosis is by identifying elevated homocysteine and methionine levels so next in line is beckwith wiedemann syndrome you see the baby is very large 11 p overgrowth spectrum is present it's an imprinting disorder as we all know that this over expression of igf2 and under expression of cdkn1c so this is because of uniparental trisomy and you can see the large ears the ear defects and the face which is present large head and almost baby is a very big baby at birth so uh, the another important uh, syndrome that i have been mentioned here is kalman syndrome this is again associated with hypogonadism 
apparently there would be no other distribution feature. The patient comes with around 16, 17 year old uh, child is brought with delayed puberty and tall stature. The child is continuously growing. I have to buy a new set of genes almost every one year or two years is what the patient, parents often complain. And then say that the child has delayed puberty. And when you test the sense of smell, it is missing. Kalman syndrome, tall stature, delayed puberty, and sense of smell being lost. And on MRI, you can find uh, optic bulb atrophy or absence. So diagnostic approach. So how do you approach these people? We have to look at the height and uh, if the height is more than 2.5 stand standard deviation score, we need to evaluate. And there are other height parameters also. And now because we are dealing with syndromic features, it's important to understand the syndromic features we have just seen a while ago. So it's important to know uh, to document all these because a major proportion can be divided easily with respect to the upper segment, lower segment ratio and arm span. And it's very important to identify syndromic features, especially with, with regards to the dysmorphic features in the face, intellect, and developmental delay. And pubertal status is very important subsequently to identify whether there is normal puberty or delayed puberty or advanced puberty that we're dealing with. And then bone age, serum IGF-1, and other testings are also essential in this particular patient. The lamp examination, especially to differentiate between Marfan's homocysturia, echocardiography, card, and karyotyping, especially if there is a disproportionate short stature, subtle dysmorphic features, and learning disabilities that are present, then going with the karyotype, Kleinefelter's is of what we often see. Special investigations involves serum and urine homocysteine levels, and genetic testing for fibrillin 1, FN, FMR1 is what we are looking at. So, in a nutshell, a patient presents with uh, tall stature, height is more than two standard deviation score. So look at dysmorphic features, intellectual disabilities, and developmental delay. Is the child proportionate, uh, having a proportionate tall stature or a disproportionate tall stature? In proportionate, we have to revise SOTOS, Weavers, BWS, Fragile X, and Pehmel syndrome. And in disproportionate to revise, we have Marfan syndrome, Kleinefelter syndrome, homocystinuria, triple X syndrome. That is how we differentiate. And then how do we manage them? Many of them, regarding height, you have to give them reassurance. Not much can be done now. Treatment of the underlying condition is very important and associated problems is very important to prevent morbidity and mortality. And then, especially when it is Marfan's and homocystinuria. And then you have sex steroid therapy. In delayed puberty cases and Kleinefelter syndrome and in other situations wherein there is no sex steroid, so there is no epiphyseal fusion, give the sex steroid therapy gradually. And then bilateral, this is another approach which can be done, bilateral percutaneous epiphyseoidosis. You're fusing the epiphysis because the child is not stopping to grow. And then we can also use somatostatin analogs. So the often question that is raised at this point is, what is the predicted adult height? What, how long will my child grow? Especially when it comes to girls in India, parents are very worried. How, how much tall, taller will my girl grow? I have to find a suitable groom for the uh, girl child is a question that is often raised. It's, it's, it's somehow we have to let them know that we can calculate the predicted height. You have very few methods. You have so many methods of estimation of adult height. We need to tell them that predicted adult height needs to be calculated and you can have to reassure the patients and the parents again and again. And then what is the future directions? Where are we? Are we just to do with sex steroids and then other things? No. We have some promising therapies which are still in the research line. We have growth plate specific serms, FGFR3 agonists, NPBR B type antagonists, which can be used. So, to conclude my talk today, most children with tall stature are healthy, but it is important to exclude pathological causes. Careful history and examination, relevant investigations are important, especially finding out the dysmorphic features and classifying them. Finding out about puberty and delayed puberty and SSA is important and it will clinch our diagnosis and we would be able to offer some solace to our patients. Thank you so much.